Oops, we've accidentally built a particle accelerator. <laughs> Today we're looking at another heavily requested XKCD what if video. Specifically, what if NASCAR had no rules? Rocket powered cars, nuclear powered cars? That sounds cool. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. This is a question from Hunter who asked, what if you ignored all the rules of car racing and had a contest which was simply to get a human being around a track 200 times wow. as fast as possible? What strategy would win? So this is interesting. So let's just get someone around the track as fast as possible. So yeah, strap them to a rocket, put them in, could use something silly like a hyperloop in a circuit. So as a nuclear engineer, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of just a circuit would be something like a particle accelerator, but a human being won't stay a human being for very long at those speeds. As far as what would win as least likely to cause an accident, maybe something like a nuclear powered car, a slow and steady wins, wins the race, but something that you don't have to refuel or take to the pit crew or anything like that. Because a rocket, good luck getting it to turn tightly enough. Say the racer has to survive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of strategy, it turns out that the best you'll be able to do is about 90 minutes. There are lots of ways you could build your vehicle. An electric car, a rocket sled, or a carriage that runs along a rail like a roller coaster. <laughs> Though, if we're using out there technology, maybe a Hyperloop could do it. I know this isn't proven, but let's assume the racetrack is two and a half miles. And Hyperloop concepts are about 750 miles per hour. It figures out to about 12 seconds per lap. And at 200 laps is around 40 minutes. But Hyperloop isn't really a car in the sense of the word. So we may, he may just be looking at cars. Also, it has technology that's even more out there than the slinky dog dash. <laughs> In each case, it's pretty easy to develop the design to the point where the human is the weakest part. Mm. The problem is acceleration. On the curved parts of the track, drivers will feel powerful g Especially a vehicle that isn't sealed and doesn't have all of the inertial dampeners required to, dam to prevent the g-forces from killing you. Okay. I see what he's going with. The Daytona Speedway in Florida has two main curves, and if the vehicles go around them too fast, the drivers will die from the acceleration alone. Okay. If those those curves are, are really that bad, it's not like a uniform shape. I've never watched NASCAR. I never got that into it. If it's got some really nasty curves, then that might also prevent you from even setting up your, your hyperloop. So I didn't take into consideration how nasty this this track can get. <laughs> And I'm sure they do they do that on purpose. They design it to make the to make the race harder than it could be in a nice than something that's more circular. For extremely brief periods, such as during car accidents, people can experience hundreds of G's and survive. One G is the pull you feel when you're standing on the ground under Earth's gravity. Fighter pilots can experience up to 10 G's during maneuvers, and perhaps because of that, 10 G's is often used as a rough limit for what people can handle. However, it's all about amount of time. It's it's the amount of time that you're that you're exposed to something. Fighter pilots only experience 10 Gs very briefly. Our driver would be experiencing them in pulses for minutes and probably yeah. hours. There's a good NASA document on the physical effects of acceleration, and the data shows that for periods on the order of an hour, normal humans can only handle three to six Gs of acceleration. If we limit our vehicle to four Gs, its top speed on the turns at Daytona will be about 240 miles per hour. At this speed, the course will take about two hours to complete, which is definitely faster than anyone has driven in an actual car, but not even by an hour. But wait, we forgot about the straightaways. We could accelerate the vehicle up to a higher speed while on straight segments, and then decelerate it back down when approaching curves. This is cool. I didn't think this much into the shape of a track. I just assumed that tracks were more of a uh, boring circular or oval type shape. Shows how little I know about racing. But <laughs> that's uh, I'm glad he's taken this into consideration. The real challenge is if he actually were to do this at Daytona. The car go around the track in less time and conveniently result in a situation where the driver can be kept at a relatively constant magnitude of acceleration through the whole trip. It would be more like experiencing the constant, stronger pull of gravity on a heavy planet rather than the jerky acceleration of an overpowered roller coaster. Keep in mind that the direction of the Roller coaster with a rocket. That's... that's something. ...direction would keep changing depending on whether the vehicle is going around a curve or speeding up or slowing down. Yes. Every direction of acceleration has its particular consequences, but humans can survive acceleration best if they're accelerated in the direction of their chest, like a... No blood and head upward. <laughs> Eyeballs unhappy going forward, sure. Backward, hard to breathe, yep. 
Now in the nuclear industry, we do look at G-forces when it comes to both human factors engineering and just overall design of the reactor, its containment facility, and all of its safety systems. Though the numbers we're dealing with are a lot smaller, not in terms of 5Gs, 20Gs, and that's because the plant's not moving, or it's not supposed to. If you have an earthquake or something, that'll cause it to move, but it's on the order of hundreds to tenths of Gs, because a tenth of a G is considered a lot. That's considered a big enough of a seismic and ex event an acceleration event that you'd want the reactor to immediately and safely shut itself down. Though if you take into consider the mass and the size and the expansive structure of a nuclear power plant, the amount of forces you're dealing with, um, 0.05 Gs is far more force than 20 Gs on your race car. <laughs> For accelerating forward. The body is least capable of being accelerated downward toward the feet, which causes blood to pile up in the head. Yeah. So to keep our driver alive, we'll need to swivel them around so they're always being pressed against their back. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> and now we're kind of getting back to some of the silly hyperloop type designs involving sealed tubes and positioners to make the acceleration and deceleration more manageable. I really like this channel. <laughs> Limited to 4 Gs in this way, our driver will finish the course in a little under an hour and 45 minutes. In comparison, the fastest modern Daytona race cars take about three hours to finish the 200 laps. Okay. If we raise the limit to 6 Gs, the time drops Ooh. to an hour and 20 minutes. At 10 Gs continuously, well past human tolerability, it would still take over an hour. It would also involve breaking the sound barrier on the backstretch. Yeah, and then there's a point where how much stress can the vehicle withstand, too. I think once you get above 6 Gs, then I can't imagine a car withstanding that much more, even, even something like a Formula One, if we're taking your basic NASCAR designs out of the equation. To give you a sense of scale, a typical car, you're looking at less than one. Maybe two if you have a fancy sports car, but obviously nothing compared to a race car. So barring dubious concepts like liquid breathing to counteract the effects of continual exposure to Wow, he's bringing in liquid breathing to this. This is awesome. G-forces. Human biology limits us to Daytona finishing times over an hour. All right. Well, I'm noticing there's a good bit of time left. Is he going to bring in cybernetics or something crazy? If we drop the survive requirement, oh how fast God. can we get the vehicle to go around the track? A vehicle going around the track. Okay, uh, time to make a particle accelerator. <laughs> because that's clearly where we're going with this. You're just, just a vehicle. Define vehicle. <laughs> can it be a particle? Let's imagine a vehicle attached with there Kevlar straps to a pivot in the center of a similarly sized circular track. In effect, this is a giant centrifuge. This lets us apply one of my favorite weird equations, which says that the edge of a spinning disk can't go faster than the square root of the specific strength of the material it's made of, or it'll tear itself apart. That's your favorite. For strong materials like Kevlar, this speed is 1 to 2 kilometers per second. At those speeds, a capsule could conceivably finish the race in about 10 minutes, although definitely not with a living driver inside. Yeah. <laughs> And you're making it a circle, too. Okay, forget the centrifuge. What if we build a chute like a bobsled course and send a ball bearing rocketing down it? Sadly, the disk equation strikes again. The ball bearing can't roll faster than a couple of kilometers per second or it will be spinning too fast and it will also yeah, tear itself yeah. apart. Mm -hmm. What if we make it slide? Diamond is one of the toughest materials, so we could imagine a diamond capsule sliding along a smooth diamond chute. Since it doesn't need to rotate- I like that he made it like a gem. <laughs> a gemstone with a point traveling that fast. That's terrifying. Could potentially survive stronger acceleration than a rolling ball bearing. However, the sliding would result in substantially more friction than the yeah. ball bearing example, and our diamond might catch fire. All right, we're going in the direction, so what's going to be next? Maglevs? <laughs> to defeat friction, we could levitate yep. the capsule with magnetic fields yep. and make it progressively smaller and lighter to accelerate and steer it more easily. Oops, we've accidentally built a particle accelerator. <laughs> yeah. And while it doesn't exactly fit the criteria in Hunter's question, a particle accelerator makes for a neat comparison. The particles in the Large Hadron Collider's beam go very close to the speed of light. At that speed, they complete 500 miles in 2.7 milliseconds. That's true. Though trying to make something like this with a sizable vehicle, I think we're making the Hyperloop look practical by comparison, trying to accelerate a 
vehicle sized object but then again we're stretching the definition of vehicle the vehicle could be a, a particle so there you have it i mean the large hadron collider uses charged particles such as protons that bring them in from pre-accelerators to get you to go on the main accelerator it uses oscillating electric fields because protons are positively charged they are susceptible to the effects of these electric fields and you steer with the magnetic fields that he showed earlier superconducting dipole magnets very powerful and very controlled and for focusing is when you use the quad pole magnets and that's really just to keep them tightly packed and preventing the protons from spreading out and hitting the sides of the track if you will it's also in a near vacuum one of the only ways to get close to the speed of light because that's the speed of light in a vacuum <laughs> and it's accelerated in stages to get it up to that particular speed though if you're going to use it to race i would take the c part out of the large hadron collider because there you're designed to crash them into things at specific speeds so maybe just take that last bit out for your uh for your racing though you need to find a way to get it to slow down safely because it doesn't slow things down it collides them which i guess is a form of slowing them down wikipedia lists about 850 motor racing tracks the lhc beam could run the equivalent of a full daytona 500 on each of those 850 tracks one after another in about two seconds <laughs> before the drivers had made it to the first turn and that's really as fast as you can go that's awesome i love how they this one was really good. They brought in so many examples here, including the, hey, let's just forgo the driver and make a particle accelerator. Thanks so much for the recommendation. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.